Hi, it's me again. I'm Andy. Um, we've been working on a uh, Android game, and up until now, uh, it hasn't been an Android game. It's been a game that at some point in the future is going to be on Android. Well, I'm happy to tell you, it is now an Android game. Uh, it's not yet much fun to play, um, but it's about as fun to play on your phone as it is on the desktop. So I've succeeded in my mission, uh, which was to write almost all of the code outside of Android uh, and get all the advantages you get of being able to run on your local machine. Um, uh, things are faster, stuff like that. Um, you can run your unit tests without without actually loading them onto a device, um, and then be able to reuse all that stuff on my phone. So today I'm going to try and share with you um, how I made that work. And basically, it is the story that. Um, we've been developing over the last few videos um, and it has all come together. There was, a, there was a slight full start for me. I started up a separate um, GitHub repository for my Android stuff uh, which I, it turns out I didn't need to do. Obviously I can do it all inside one GitHub repository but the basic insight that, that, that brought about that GitHub repository was that I would keep the non-Android stuff completely and utterly separate from the Android stuff uh, and just build the non-Android stuff into a jar which is used in the Android stuff. So let's have a quick uh, review of how it works so far. So watch, um, I guess, the previous video if you want to see a kind of how the layout of the code works um, in the non-Android world. So when you see me switch to this Eclipse window, that's the stuff I've written uh, that is completely not Android. So this is pure Java. It runs in a Swing UI. Let's run it. it runs in a Java Swing UI. Um, therefore, should run on any any machine you can throw it at. As long as you've got Java on there. And the game is these rabbits coming out, and you give them abilities, and then try and get them into the exit. Uh, and yes, it's exactly like Lemmings and Bingo's, except it's intended to be a bit easier to. Um, control on a small device like a phone or a, a tablet with your finger than those games are. Also, I love those games, so let, why not have another one? Um, yeah, so that's how it works in the Swing UI. This Eclipse window, as I said, is um, is all completely non-Android. So what that means is that I can run all my unit tests uh, quite quickly. Let me do that. So I, I, I can run them in Eclipse, but I also I tend to run them using my make file. So this make file runs a bit of ant to compile the Java uh, and runs all the tests as you can see. What did that, what did that take? Two seconds to run all those tests. It's not bad. Uh, certainly a lot quicker than loading it onto an Android device and, and running them there for tests that are completely unrelated to Android. Um, what I found I did have to do in order to make this work, the only class, so I've, I've broken this up, this non-Android code up into separate projects. So you've got something that I've called the engine, which is most of the logic of the game, and then render, which is the logic of drawing stuff, but in a platform independent way. Uh, and then I've got UI swing, which is basically supposed to be stuff that's to do with the swing user interface specifically. And then UI text, which is about a text UI. Let's show you that just for fun, shall we? I'm really proud of it. I know no one will ever, no one will ever play it but I still love it. So you can see, you can play this game in a pure text interface. It's exactly the same game um, without the graphics, which I find exciting. Anyway, um, So that text UI is in here. So basically the bits that we want to have on Android are these two projects, the engine project and the render project. Um, we don't want the swing stuff on Android, that wouldn't make sense. So um, what we what I've done is I've built a jar file which just contains the code from these two projects and then imported it into my Android Studio project which I'll show you in a sec. Um, and what was I gonna say about that? Yeah, so and the only thing the only mistake that I'd made it turns out in terms of writing this code. Uh, well actually there may be another mistake that comes back to bite me. We'll see about that. Um, the only obvious mistake that I'd made was that I'd used uh, a class called Dimension, which is from the AWT, java.awt.dimension. So AWT is actually the the old user interface world um, 
before Swing was the interface on Java. Um, uh, and a lot of the AWT classes are still used by Swing. And one of them is called Dimension. It's basically just a width and a height. Um, so I had used that. But actually on Android, when you import it into Android, it says, I don't know about this class called Dimension because the Android Java environment doesn't have any of that AWT or Swing code. It has a, a lot of the standard Java library, but not that bit. Because it's to do with a user interface that isn't relevant to it. So I had to write this this class called dimension. And I'd used that in a few places. So for example, the size of a world was a, a dimension. So I wrote my own class called dimension, which works exactly the same way as far as I'm concerned, as far as my code is concerned as a dimension class that was there. So as you can see, not a great deal of code, not a huge price to pay for having this stuff work on Android. Interestingly, I, I've done quite a lot of stuff that's relatively modern-ish Java. Um, and Android seems to be fine with that, so I've used a few, I guess, I guess they're quite uh, old hat these days. I used a few generics and um, iterator stuff that I wasn't totally sure that because I chose on Android quite a low uh, compatibility with quite old uh, libraries, I wondered whether that stuff wouldn't work, and I'd have to port my my more modern Java back to old, uh, older looking, less nice Java. Uh, I didn't have to do that at all. I chose Android 2.2 .2 as the compatibility version, which is obviously a long time ago, um, even older than my phone, which is a 2.3 phone, um, and everything seemed to work fine. It does actually warn me that um, it's building based on a, uh, it's, it's using a jar file that's from a newer version of Java than what it supports, and that that may cause problems, but it doesn't seem to cause problems, so I don't know, maybe it will, um, but so far it hasn't. So let me show you what I did. So I've got all this code um, written, and I got the game running in Swing, made sure I was happy that it kind of basically worked. Happy that I could unit test it, especially that text interface helps me unit test it. And once I've done that, um, I made a jar file. So basically, uh, so basically, I have a, a make file target called dist, um, and all that does is makes this jar um, rabbit escape generic dot jar. And here's where I make the jar. Basically, we compile first. We make sure there's a dist directory. Uh, we delete one if there's already one there. Then we go into the rabbit escape engine bin directory, which is where the compile puts all the class files and all the other stuff that's going to get um, zipped up into that jar. And then we use the jar command, which is part of the Java library of commands, to jar up basically everything we can find inside that bin directory. So this find command here um, finds everything in this directory. So we've gone into bin and just said, you know, jar up everything you can find in here. Um, put it into that jar file. And then, so that create, that C is for create. And then we've, up, we've updated the jar file by doing exactly the same thing inside the, the render directory. So now we've got the engine directory and the render directory. Both of their bin directories have got everything that's got built in. Uh, the class files and all the graphics and everything get put into there. Jar them up into this one jar with these two commands. I'm sure there's probably better ways uh, I could use one command or something, but I don't know. Anyway, that works. Then we end up with a jar file, um, which goes in the disk directory. So, it's in here. so there it is, rabbit escape generic dot jar. Once we've got that rabbit escape generic dot jar, what I did was I made a new project, or a new directory rather, called Rabbit Escape UI Android. And in there is a completely separate project. So this Eclipse world knows about these four directories, and this could be using IntelliJ. Um, I, I started out using Eclipse, I'm not quite sure. On my laptop I'm using IntelliJ. IntelliJ seems really good, and I normally hate Eclipse, so why I used Eclipse I don't know, but anyway, maybe just because um, <clears throat> you or I might be familiar with it, so it seemed like a place to start. Anyway, point is, uh, these, there is four directories in here, Rapid Escape Engine, Render, UI Swing, and UI Text. Those are, uh, th those are known about by Eclipse, and this Android one is not known about by Eclipse. 
And then this inside this Android one, there is set up for the Android Studio project. So here's my Android Studio. Let's get out of the way. No, I can't. All right. Well, what should we do? We might want that. This, by the way, is my proof to you that it's running on my phone. Um, I can hold it up to. Maybe at the end of this video, I'll hold it up to the camera so it looks really annoying and rubbish. But for now, you can see it is running. There's a program here called Rabbitscape. And you can see the rabbits walking around, and I, I promise you, they really walk around. Um, so here's my Android Studio. Oh, here's my Android Studio environment. Um, so this only knows about that Rabbit Escape UI Android directory. It doesn't know the others are there. Uh, and that's the way I've stopped them from polluting each other. If I tried to import all the Eclipse projects into here, I'm sure it would try and do it, but then once I wanted to run unit tests or anything like that, um, they'd be running on the phone, um, and they get all the, you get um, compiled versions of the Java built, but it would be uh, code that can only run on an Android device, not on my local computer here. So I'd be sitting around waiting for the unit test, if, it, if they even worked. Obviously, all the swing stuff wouldn't work, you know, it'd be a nightmare. So, you know, the whole point of this exercise, apart from trying to write uh, a game that hopefully you'll like, or I'll like, um, is to work out how to spend most of our time not tied specifically to Android, but still have things work nicely in Android. So, here's what I did. I, I made a uh, Android Studio project in the same way that you've seen before. So, um, you make a new project, choose the directory, so I chose this Android uh, UI-Android directory when it was empty. Um, um, came in and chose a blank project, just like we've done in the previous videos. If you want to see video of that, have a look at the previous videos. Chose a completely blank um, Android app. And then I started off um, by basically using some of the code that we've done in the previous videos to make myself a menu. So the, the menu activity is really very similar to um, the menu that we made in uh, a video a couple of videos ago. Let's see whether I can bring up the um, design. Yeah, here we are. So it, the the application starts off in. Uh, in the menu activity, and I don't think this is the menu activity. Activity Android menu is what I'm looking for. Here we are. Here we are. Okay, so I've made my screen small so that you can read my writing on this. Um, Uh, on this video, I'll read the text, but um, means my layout's a bit squashed. Yeah, so basically, uh, if you watch the video, you'll be quite familiar with this. Basically, it's a relative layout with a list view in it, and what we do is we store some state about uh, what what bit of the, what sub items of the menu we're at um, until we get to the right place in the menu. By the way, at the moment, I'm not uh, this menu works nicely, but any button you press gets you into just the one level that I've got set up. So it's not, I'm not quite there on actually using this menu, but it all works exactly how we saw in the video. Um, so that code is pretty much what you saw in that video about making a menu. Only difference is, instead of having, I had at the top here, the definition of what the menu items were, well instead of that, I'm actually using the definition of the menu items um, that are in, my, in the Eclipse world, which I think I probably showed in one video, maybe the, the last one. So that the, the reason it can get hold of that is because we've done this import here. Import Rabbit Escape Engine Menu Menu Definition. You can see that is the engine package. Uh, so that comes from outside of the Android Studio world, from the Eclipse world. So the question is, how do you get that code into Android Studio? The answer is, you you put a jar, you make a libs directory inside the app directory. So in my make file, I do this. So once I've made that uh, jar file, 
I have an Android section in my Makefile down at the bottom. We do some Android specific stuff, including making some images, which we'll maybe look at in a bit. I have this target called Android Pre, which means uh, you need to do this before you do your Android development. So you just say make Android Pre, and then you're ready to um, to do uh, to go to start Android Studio and build the code. Um, so what Android Pre does is it makes the images, which it does exactly the same way as we make the other images. Uh, puts them into the MDPI folder, and their PNG is exactly the same as the PNGs we're using in the Swing UI. Uh, at some point, I will cover how we can do different density, high density, and extra high density, and so on uh, images. Um, but before I can do that, I need to work out what the right thing to do is. And in particular, how do I know what the right size is? Um, is 32 by 32 the right size for these MDPI images or something else? Uh, anyway, uh, what this Android Pre thing does is it builds, it builds the images and it builds a jar file inside uh, uh, rabbit escape UI Android slash app slash libs slash rabbit escape generic dot jar. So you'll notice that's the same name as the jar we made earlier. And actually the target that makes that jar file, which is here, all it does is make sure that the libs directory exists and then copies in the jar file that we've already made. Okay, so that was a lot of explanation for a very simple thing. So basically you make sure the libs directory exists, you put the jar file into there, uh, but that's not enough. Android Studio uh, won't recognize it. What you then have to do is, I think, right-click on it and say, um, I think it's import library. I mean, what if I copy it and make another one? Perhaps it will let me show you what I did. So let's go into uh, Android. Uh, app and then libs. Oh, I'm in the way again. So we've gone into this libs directory. If I have a look in here, there's this jar file. So let's copy it and pretend it's another one. Let's call that other one jar2.jar. Oops. Um, so you can see there's two jars in there now. There's this one and there's this one, which is actually a copy. So let's try and import that in. So You'll notice Android Studio refreshes itself and it can see the jar in there, but you can't open it up and look inside like we can with the other one. So what you have to do is say, add as library. So right click on it, say add as library, add to module app, okay. I think it's doing it. It may get annoyed because there's clashing names in here between the two different jars. We'll see what it says. Um, there's a load of, load of classes that are um, in both of these jars, so presumably it'll get annoyed about that and tell us we can't do it. All right, the point is once you've, um, once you've done that add as library, this jar becomes browsable. You can see all the stuff in it. Uh, and these classes are now usable. So we can see in here Inside the menu here, we've got the menu definition class, which is the one I was showing you a second ago. And that's now usable in our Android code. If you double click it, um, you don't necessarily get uh, all the useful, you can't actually read the code in here, so you have to go back to Eclipse if you want to see what the code is. And when you make changes in Eclipse, you have to rerun this make uh, target to recopy it, and then you may have to right click on here and say synchronize to make sure it gets updated. So there's a little bit of hassle there, but uh, I found in, uh, in IntelliJ, that works really nicely. It's very, you have to remember to run the make target, but it doesn't kind of get behind and stuff, which I find really annoying in other environments. Anyway, point is, now we've got this jar file in, let's delete that one. Since, uh, um, since we've already got one. And this is the real one that I did exactly the same thing with. So all of our code that's non-Android specific is coming from this jar. It's all available for us to import. Uh, in our Android code. So we've got this menu, based on that menu definition, which, where is it actually used? Um, and there was something about that, here we are, yeah, yeah, so you, you, we asked for the main menu from it. And what this menu definition gives us back is one of these menu objects, which isn't exactly what we had in that video. This, so this menu object, um, basically has 
um, it tells you what the menu item is going to be called and uh, and what sub menu items and things you can go to so it's pretty much exactly as we did in the menu video um, and then once you click on one of these menu items you go into the Android game activity and the Android game activity is mostly uh, very similar to the game loop that I showed you in the um, I think the previous video the last video um, except I've also added a little bit of UI so let's see whether we can show this a bit smaller so what this is is it's a top layout uh, uh, sorry it's a linear layout which goes um, across so it, uh, it's called, it's called it a horizontal layout, which is weird because to me this is a vertical layout. But anyway, uh, whatever the terminology terminology you want to use, it's basically a linear layout, which means it, it, it breaks everything up into columns or rows. In this case, columns, and we have to, we have one column and then an empty space on the right. And the empty space on the right is where we're going to add our um, our la uh, what's it called layout view um, surface view surface view. So we're going to encode, we're going to add our surface view to this top layout object, which is a linear layout. Uh, so in this designer, we've just left that blank. And then so there's only one column, and that column has a scroll view in it, which is where all our buttons go. Um, uh, so the, the, most of the buttons are dynamically generated based on what's in the world, because they're things like, uh, they're basically the abilities that you can give to your rabbits. Um, and some of the buttons are hard-coded. The buttons that are hard-coded are the mute button and the pause button. So I've put them in here. And then I've made this radio group, uh, which is where the abilities are going to get put. So the abilities aren't radio buttons, because radio buttons don't look very nice, and I couldn't... I did quite a bit of fiddling about before I decided not to use radio buttons. But if you put them inside a radio group, I'm hoping uh, that someone's using a screen reader or something like that. Um, well, I'm keeping the radio group I'm up to date with what's been selected in this list of pretend radio buttons that aren't really radio buttons. Hopefully someone using a screen reader or some other um, way of navigating this, seeing a radio group and then seeing what's been selected in there, hopefully it'll work for them. I appreciate any feedback if that doesn't work properly. Um, of course, the, if you're using a screen reader, the rest of the screen, the bit with the actual game on it, is going to be very hard. Um, to interpret so that maybe my efforts there are pointless or maybe you could give me some feedback about how I could make that bit work as well. Um, I'd be really excited to do that. Anyway, um, so yeah, so it's a layout and then basically this big space in the middle is where we put our our surface view. Uh, in the video where I did the uh, Android game loop I called it my surface view and for a long time in this game I also called it my surface view until I finally settled on a fantastic name of game surface view, which is a tiny bit better. Uh, so what we do, so basically this game surface view, uh, uh, when the surface gets created it makes one of these game objects, and when the game object gets created it makes a game loop object, and this is stuff that hopefully you've seen in that previous video. This, this game loop looks a lot like um, the game loop we made in that video. The only difference is I added pause ability, so um, if you press the pause button, then this pause thing becomes true, and basically we wait. We wait until you're not paused anymore. Um, we still allow you to scroll, so I check it. I check ten times a second whether any scroll events have happened by just waking up every ten seconds and, and doing this scrolling stuff. And actually, the scrolling um, is all new. I hadn't. I didn't do any scrolling in the the game loop video. Pretty. I don't know, slightly annoyed about the scrolling, the way I had to do it, but also quite proud that I, it, it seems to, the scrolling seems to work quite nicely, quite similar to the rest of the UI, even though I had to completely uh, make it up myself instead of using something that's already there, which I would like to do. I wonder whether I'll talk about scrolling in this video or not. Yes, all right, I'll talk about it very briefly. Okay, so before, just before we do that, let's talk about how we make the buttons appear down the left-hand side. Can I get my picture back for you? Um, of what I mean by the button that's down the left hand side, yes I can. So, 
So let's just take another screenshot and set it running again. Okay. Oops, that's upside down. Okay, so here's your rabbit coming out of the thing. And then down the left hand side are your buttons. Um, you've got uh, one button for each ability that rabbits can have. So this one's build a bridge, this one's bash a hole, this one here yeah, you can't quite see is a digger. So notice this was in a scroll view, this stuff, um, in that design area. So the, you can scroll this by um, moving it with your finger in the normal way. And that, that's real scrolling implemented by the operating system, not a hokey one made by me. This central bit in the middle is scrolled in a hokey way by me. So anyway, I was saying, how do you make these buttons? So what I did was I made a radio group, as you saw, called the abilities group. And then inside this create abilities function, uh, we make some stuff and put it in the abilities group. So the world, which is coming from the Eclipse world, the non-Android world, has this list of abilities called abilities, which are token dot types, or the keys of that map are token dot types. So we loop through all those abilities that we've been given, pull them out, and for each one, we we add we we add a view to this radio group, and the view the type of view we add is an ability button, which is a class that I defined, and which I'll show you in a sec. And uh, that you tell the abilities group when you change, um, then make this then use this listener to deal with that. So when they change when the the radio group realizes something's changed, then we tell the actual game change your ability to this ability um, and then for each of these radio buttons we set them either checked or unchecked so this is the basically simulation of a, of a radio group because these aren't really radio buttons or it is a radio group but those but inside it are just ordinary buttons so what we do is we set we set uh, the one that is that was just pressed um, to checked and all the others we set to be not pressed so this is the one we pressed if i equals button index we're looping through all of the buttons uh, on the one where i is the same as the thing we pressed we set it checked to true and on all the other things around this loop this is going to come out false whoops this expression here is going to come out false so set checked with set to false so that set checked is something that we've implemented inside this class ability button so ability button is a image button so that's a button with an image on it uh, which is part of Android but we're, we're customizing it so we customize it by going and finding the right image to display based on the ability name that you asked for we do a get drawable resources dot get drawable uh, and then give the uh, resource ID, which is ability underscore, and then the ability name, just because that's what the actual image is called. So let's have a look in here for what am I looking for? Resources. Where are the resources? Yeah, here. Yeah. So inside inside drawable MDPI, I've dumped a whole load of PNGs exactly the same way we dump PNGs into the Swing UI, and one of these PNGs is called ability underscore bash. So using that ability name. We do a get identifier, which gets the ID based on the name of this um, image, and then we do get drawable based on the identifier, and that gives us back a drawable. We can use we can do a set image drawable, which sets the image of this button. Um, this is apparently slow. Using this get identifier uh, is slow. Uh, it doesn't seem at all slow relative to actually drawing the graphics on the screen. So no problem for us. Um, and then we have two uh, methods that we've defined inside this thing. When you're checked, when you've been told you're checked, that you come into this part of the if, and you set the you set a color filter on the background, uh, which basically makes the button go a bit blue. So if I if I do a screen capture again, I'll try and press one of these buttons before I do the capture, um, and you'll see what I mean. I'm sure you can imagine it anyway. Um, so basically, when you when you press one of these ability buttons, it goes blue, uh, like this, and the others get unblued again. So the way you unblue them is you say clear color filter, and you must not forget to call invalidate, or nothing will happen. You won't be able to see uh, that change that change has happened. So that's basically the ability button that we've made. It's an image button with a slightly extra bit of. Um, behavior. The other thing I have is you can disable it. When you run out of that ability, I want to disable the button. The way I've done that is just completely getting rid of the image from it 
And also to make sure it didn't change size when you did that. So that's why I did that bit. So get, uh, we get rid of the image. So it kind of goes, it turns into a blank button. That was my best way of, that I could find of making it look like it, it had run out. Make it clear that it had run out. So let's very quickly talk about how I did scrolling on this um, view. So, uh, let's go here. so once the um, I'm in the wrong place, that's why I'm looking, getting confused. Okay, so in the game loop, we have a function called scroll by. So if, if someone calls that to say, I want you to scroll to show a different part of the level, they pass in uh, the x and y coordinates of the where you want the top left hand side of the screen to represent in the level. Um, and basically we say, if um, uh, if you try to scroll off to the left, then don't. And if you try to scroll off to the right, then don't. And if you try to scroll off the top, then don't. And if it, blah, blah, blah. So basically, um, we set these scroll Y things uh, to a reasonable answer, given what we've been told to do, which could have been unreasonable. And then when we draw the graphics, we pass in those values to our drawing function. And our drawing function basically calls them offset X, offset Y, They've been minus by this point. And the renderer that we saw um, in the last episode already took in offsets to say which bit or how far offset am I drawing this level. So what actually happens when we're scrolling here is we draw the entire level, but some of it's off the screen. And it's fun. so far, the performance of that seems to be OK. So I haven't fixed it. If I have performance problems, I could obviously make it only draw the stuff that's actually visible. Uh, I've seen I've had no reason to do that. Perhaps that's already optimized by someone else who says, oh, well, that's off the screen. I don't need to draw it, in which case. Why would I bother? The rest of this stuff is basically how you saw it in the Android uh, game loop video. So the question is, who calls this scroll by function and how? So let's go back to our surface view, because that's where these events... No, let's go back to our... I can't get used to that back button behavior being different from Eclipse. In our game activity, um, we want to listen to touch events. No, it's not in here. It is, yeah, it must be in the surface view. So in the surface view, yeah, 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 oh, here it is. It's folded up. Yeah, so um, basically we have an object called scrolling, which is a class I wrote called, uh, instance of a class I wrote, which is called scrolling, which we'll look at in a sec. And when we receive a touch event on this surface view, so the way we register to ask for those touch events is, oh, inside scrolling, is it? No. That's, yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, we, we register ourselves as an on-click listener by saying we implement, we implement the interface on-click listener. And then somewhere in this code, we, oh no, no, not, yeah, no, yeah, no, that's fine. We, we register ourselves as, a, on, as an on-click listener, and we also, from somewhere, we get these touch events. I've forgotten where I did that. Maybe it's inside scrolling. Oh no no no! Okay, I'm talking rubbish. Yeah, a surface view already gets on. I get already gets touch events passed to it. So all you have to do, yeah. Okay, sorry, sorry for the faffing about. Yeah, the so surface view already has this on touch event method, and we just override it. And and what we do is we hand it off to this scrolling thing just to keep the code neat. That's off in a separate class. And something we do, which I read, uh, I read somewhere on the Android documentation, you should do is when we've decided that that touch event is a click, so some of the touch events are going to be scrolls and some are going to be clicks, when we decide that it's a click, we call a uh, code that ends up in this on-click event. So we basically trigger uh, a click event. Rather than just handling it as a click within our own code, we, we pass the uh, it through the system idea of a click. So that means things like if the user has a sound effect that's supposed to go when you click, it will go when this happens, which might be annoying or might be the right thing to do. So this is uh, this is the recommended thing to do. And I think it's sensible that 
we've decided they clicked based on the touch events we saw. So we go through the click handling. And basically the click handling says uh, uh, stick stick the token that they the ability token that they asked for into the world in the right place. Um, exactly the same way we do it in the swing UI when you click uh, on the world. And then um, we also notify someone outside of this surface view of the number left of this chosen ability that you've just cha you potentially changed. So actually that num left listener is actually the outside activity uh, and that's how the activity can update those buttons to disable them when you've run out of that ability. So the main, main part of this code is inside the scrolling object which, actually, which does all the logic around touch events. And this has been a bit hokey, I just worked it out as I went along and it may therefore not work brilliantly so don't take it as too good an example but it seems to work so far. Um, so basically the types of touch event you can get can be uh, they started touching, so that's like a down, like a downwards click, or they moved around a bit, or they stopped touching, which is an up. Um, and basically, what we do is when they, whenever they touch or move, we set the current scrolling position to wherever the X uh, was, and we when they start touching, we remember where they started off from, just in case. Um, and when they stop, we again we set the current position to wherever they touched. Um, but then, if they moved a little way, um, or rather, let's talk about first. So, if they didn't move, so if if we if the distance squared is less than twenty five, so it's basically if they only moved under five pixels, we consider this to be a click. So, what we do is we call perform click, and that's how we get off into the click code that I was showing you a minute ago. So if they if they didn't move much, we count it as a click. Otherwise, uh, when they let go, we we start a flinger, which basically means uh, a little bit of scrolling that happens when you flick your finger uh, on the device. It, 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 there's a bit of inertia and it scrolls a bit further than you did. So the 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 code to just move to where you scrolled it to is really simple. We just set current x to wherever the event happened. So the only the only uh, complicated thing is that. Um, when they let go, we want to allow it to fling a little bit, and that's where this flinger thing happens. So, when when we get any actual events from touches, we just cancel that flinger, just just say stop doing what you're doing, and then when they let go, uh, if they moved a bit, we start a new flinger, and a new flinger a flinger start, runs in a thread. So we we make this flinger, and then we tell it to start. So here's what the flinger does. It um. Uh, it makes a new thread and starts that thread and the thread runs inside this run loop and what the run loop does is gets the velocity so in the scrolling we captured how much they'd moved the last the last time we got a move event the velocity is basically just the amount they moved uh, this is the current position this is the previous current position so the velocity is the difference between them so how fast were you moving when you let go we slow that down a little bit by this slow factor, which is 0.95, so a bit, little bit less than one, so it gets slower every time. Um, and there's a minimum velocity at which we just give up flinging. So if your velocity uh, is is below a certain level in the x and the y direction, then we stop. Otherwise, we do a scroll and then we sleep for a certain amount of time. So this thread basically just moves you a little bit, slowing down gradually, gradually, moving you by your velocity. So do scroll is the bit that, that passes on your velocity to the scroller, which basically says, um, assuming you've got a game, then scroll by um, the velocity that, that um, is held on the scrolling object. So notice the flinger doesn't actually um, hold on to the velocity, it just uses it from the scrolling object that it's based on. So basically every time you let go of your finger we fire up a little thread which um, moves you by a certain amount. I had to tweak these things manually which I really don't like, I'd like it to come from somewhere uh, to make it feel approximately natural when you're uh, scrolling that thing around and you let go, it keeps scrolling for a bit, slows down and then stops. And we can cancel the flinger by telling this thread to stop. Um, so when we, t when we cancel the flinger we tell it to stop and we set that. Uh, flinger object to null so that next time we make one it will go in there okay uh, so that's how the scrolling happens 
Uh, do have a look on GitHub if you're interested in that. I think this bit of code that I've written that makes a game loop, uh, draws bit, bitmaps for you um, in whatever way you choose, and allows you to scroll around the game area in two directions, um, might be worth packaging up as a separate library. So at some point I might do that, especially if someone emails or comments saying that they like that, that's probably going to make me more likely to do that. Although I won't make any guarantees. So I should have started with why on earth did I do this myself? Why didn't I just use a scrollable component? So I googled around. So basically the scrollable components that are around are all one directional. They're either horizontal or vertical as part of the Android library. Various people have hacked uh, different scrolling uh, components to make them work two-dimensionally. So people have taken a copy of the Android scrollable window library and then made it work two-dimensionally. Or people have managed to hook up a horizontal scroller inside a vertical scroller. Apparently you're not supposed to do that. Uh, it's a bad idea for some reason that I didn't understand. Um, so, And then there's another bit of code that seems to have disappeared off the internet that does it and so on and so on. So I eventually gave up and I thought, well, I'll just have to write it myself. And it's not too bad. Probably the worst thing about it is this decision about when you click is probably wrong. And of course, the fact that you have to tune these um, these numbers uh, seems like if someone's customized the way their phone works, then well, it's not going to work that way inside Rabbit Escape. It's going to work the way I made it. So that seems bad. And if anyone knows a way to do this better, uh, please let me know. It seems to work well enough that the game can run. You know, my um, focus at the moment is to get the game actually running and working and make a few levels for it, see whether anyone likes it. So um, from that point of view, this definitely should be good enough. Well, no, I wouldn't say definitely. This should be good enough. Um, okay, anything else I was going to show you? Um, oh yeah, and the last thing I was going to show you was how I did the mute button. And in particular, something that I think is quite important when you're um, playing a game like this is that it remembers your mute setting. So I've got this mute button. Let's take another screenshot so I can show you. I spent most of this video sitting staring at this Android device monitor splash screen. Even though I've loaded it several times, it seems to be slow to load up again. Anyway, um, in the top left is this mute button. It's very important, I believe, that all Android or all the um, tablet or phone applications have a very easy to find mute button because the first thing you want to do when you start one up on the phone it starts making a horrible noise on the train I mean uh, is quickly press the mute button um, so the mute button is in the top left here hopefully it's clear what it does that's what it looks like when it is muted and when you press it um, again it's not so the game does start off not muted which I think is right otherwise you might not um, even realize it had sound which would be pity obviously by the way it doesn't have sound at the moment but soon it will Odd that I've implemented the mute button before I've made any sound, but I do think that's the right way around to do it because having sound without the ability to mute is a real no-no, I think, in a, on a tablet or phone. Anyway, point is, I want to, you to be able to mute it once the first time you play and never have to worry about it again because you know that that mute button sticks. So in order to do that, I've used the Android Preferences API, which I found amazingly easy and brilliant. Um, and much easier, and less annoying than when I did the Java preferences, but maybe that's because I know more about the Java preferences, I don't know. Anyway, what you do to do that is, you get hold of one of these preferences objects, which you do by calling get preferences, which I guess is uh, provided by this activity, so it's a method on activity, I guess. We, we ask for mode private, which just means no other applications or anyone else can see these settings, because we don't need that. We ask for a Boolean setting from our preferences called muted, which is asking, are you muted? We default false. So if you've never, if you've never played the game before, you won't be muted. Uh, as I said, and then we store that information in here. And then when you press the mute button, um, when you press the mute button, we get to here, so when the mute button is clicked, there's a little event on that button. We reverse the value of muted, and then in our prefs object, we call edit, which means give me an object that I can actually make changes to. Then we call put boolean, and we put in in the muted uh, uh, key, we put in the value of muted, and then we commit those preferences, which means save them. So we save them immediately. So as soon as you hit that mute button, that gets saved, even if the application crashes or something later. And then we update the mute button to show the right image based on whether or not you're muted. 
uh, in a way that's probably fairly uh, easy to understand. So my point is, this preferences object is just really refreshingly easy to use. You just say get preferences, get a boolean value out of it. You provide whatever key you like here, um, and then and then you just you do edit and then blah and then whoops and then commit, and you can obviously do a multiple um, puts in here and do all kinds of changes that you like. And then once you're ready, you commit it. And that's it, and it, it totally works. When you exit from the application, come back in again, your mute button has remembered what state it was in. So I think that's probably um, all I was going to say. We, we have succeeded. We have an Android application. It does run, um, and it is based largely on code that wasn't written inside the Android environment. It uses um, a jar file. Um, of all the non-Android code, uh, very happily uses it. Uh, I've added a pause button that works, I've added a mute button that works. You can choose abilities and drop them on the screen and the rabbits can pick them up and use them. Um, so we're kind of most of the way there towards having a playable game. Little bits that I need to do both in the Swing and the Android game is um, un you unlock levels when you, um, when you successfully complete one level, the next level becomes unlocked. Um, I need to actually design some levels. I need to smarten up how it looks to the point where I'm happy to release it, which um, probably means getting rid of these grey boxes for the, um, the land and make drawing something there that looks reasonable. Maybe drawing backgrounds, maybe redrawing the entrance and the exit that I'm not very happy with. Uh, I think if I can, redrawing these ability buttons so they look nicer. So, you know, graphical tweaks. Um, Game mechanics for unlocking levels. Probably a couple more abilities for the rabbits. Ability to climb up walls, maybe. Um, maybe uh, make blockers who can stop other rabbits getting past them. That might be enough. I might make floaters as well, just because they're really cute. Um, who, who can fall a long way without dying. Uh, that might be self-indulgent. Maybe I don't need all those abilities to make a few interesting levels. Um, so my plan next up is to get the swing version running well enough that I'm happy for people to actually play it. Get it out there, see if a few people play it and like it. If they like it, uh, get a few people, a few of my friends trying out the phone game. Um, if they like it, maybe get the phone game up and downloadable, um, and then at some point add it to the App Store when I really think it's um, people aren't going to give it one star and be horrible about it. Uh, I guess the other thing I also need to do is scalable graphics. At the moment, the the Android game is hard coded to use 32 by 32 pixel graphics, which looks just about right on my phone, but on a bigger device, uh, it's going to be tiny. So I need to figure out what the right thing to do about those different sizes of graphics is. Um, but I think that's doable. So I think most of the real um, things that I was worried were going to stop the Android game from working are solved. It's a matter of um, filling in the gaps now. Um, polishing it off and getting it done. So, do uh, add any comments if you think there's other things I should be doing, or um, if you want to have a go at the game before it's um, fully released, that would be absolutely fantastic if people want to try it out. Um, and uh, other than that, what shall I talk about next time? Well, next time, hopefully, I'll have solved some other challenge, possibly. Um, I'll be telling you where you can download the. Um, at least the swing version of the game uh, to have a play. So see you next time.